your book opens up with um, reference to PTSD, and it really made me think about soldiers coming back, and uh, you mentioned the Melee Massacre with Lieutenant Callan, who just went on, he and his Marines, if you don't know the, the Melee Massacre story, it's a terrifying example of what human beings in their fallenness are able to do under the the, the horrible impulse of, of mob think, right? Just a killing frenzy. None of them were armed and so on. And you point out that, that post-traumatic stress disorder is, I'm, I don't want to mangle yeah. it here, as much or more the realization of what you're capable of. Not oh, it's necessarily very just evil that, you, that can oh, defy you passively, very frequently but you that. can actually oh, yes, do. Oh yes, it's very, very frequently that. It's not always that, because mm -hmm. now and then you encounter someone who is almost always when you're dealing with someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, they have been touched by malevolence. There's yeah. no other way of, of, terming, of terming it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's another person, especially if, if the recipient is naive. Mm -hmm. That's a right. bad combination. Naive pe person encounters malevolence. It's like that's post-traumatic stress disorder. But yeah. naive person observes themselves doing something terrible and then cannot live with it. Mm -hmm. cannot fathom it, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. And I've had a large number of former soldiers come up to me personally and write to me in the last year saying that they're watching my lectures has really helped with their PTSD because I provide them with a philosophy of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And if you have PTSD and because you've been touched by malevolence in one way or another, you need to reorganize your thinking along lines that are fundamentally religious. You need to start seeing the world as a battleground between good and evil, which mm -hmm. is what it is in, in, in the most real sense. I, and I that's Solzhenitsyn's that. insight, right? That the battle, it, the battle lines are drawn in the human heart. Well, his, his insight is that that battle between good and evil is real, but that the most important battleground is the psychological, right? And, and that's, that's a direct extension of, I would say, New Testament theology, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the best, your best bet is to constrain the evil in your own heart, right? Rather than to concern yourself with the transgressions of your neighbor. Mm -hmm. You have plenty of malevolence to contend with on your own account. Right. You might as well start there. Yeah, the beam in your own eye. Yes, exactly mm -hmm. that, exactly that. And that's a motif that runs through 12 rules for life. Rule six yeah. is like, set yourself, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Yeah. And which I also think it's a very dark chapter because it's about the Columbine High School shooters and their mm -hmm. motivations, their satanic motivations, because that's truly the appropriate level of description. Mm -hmm. And the the autobiography of a man named Carl Panzram, who is one of the most vicious criminals of the 20th century, who wrote very clearly about just exactly why he was out to wreak as much havoc in the world as he mm -hmm. possibly could, consciously and with intent. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I make a case for that line of reasoning first. It's like, well, being is tragic being is touched by malevolence. It's why not develop resentment and hatred for it and do everything to extract revenge, revenge against God, because that's really what it is. It's like mm -hmm. Cain in the Cain and Abel story. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's exactly like that. Um, and the answer is something like, well, that's cowardly, that's one answer. And the other answer is, all that does is make everything that you're hypothetically objecting to worse. Mm -hmm. And so if you're taking a moral stance and saying, well, the horror of the world has made me bitter, resentful, murderous, and genocidal. And isn't it no wonder? It's like, well, you're gonna, you're gonna, you can't logically conclude that you should act in the way that is certain to do nothing but multiply that mm -hmm. beyond comprehension. And so there's a call to truth in there and responsibility as an antidote to, to resentment. You know, when yeah. Cain accuses God of favoring Abel in an unfair manner. And you know he has his reasons for doing that. Mm -hmm. God basically tells him, look, look to yourself. You're failing because you haven't made the right sacrifices. You're failing because you've dallied with sin consciously and produced something monstrous in, in, in consequence. Mm -hmm. And of course, Cain is absolutely outraged by that because he was irritated to begin with because Abel yeah. is succeeding and he's failing to it's fight this by sacrifices. Yes, yeah. yes, well, and then God lays it at his feet. And that's what, and then, you know, the, the story says Cain's countenance fell, and then he mm -hmm. went out and killed Abel. And the question is, why? And the answer is, well, because Abel, Abel was favored by God. It was, it, was, it was revenge against God for the conditions of being. Mm -hmm. And that's what chapter six is about, you know, and it's not, I understand that motivation, yeah. but, but God's response 
which is convenient, is correct, given that he's God. It's so nice that his response it is works correct. Out. It's like, yeah. yeah, it's like, look to your own devices before you judge being. It's like, mm -hmm. Yes. It's also an optimistic viewpoint because maybe you can change yourself. It is possible. Mm -hmm. And maybe that will work. And start with setting your own house in perfect. You as close bet. to perfect as you can get. Yeah, stop yeah. doing things that you know to be wrong. That's right. a good start. Mm -hmm. And it's what I, when I was lecturing last night to the audience, I, I suggested that they try an experiment just for a month, which is just for a month, try not to say anything that you believe to be untrue. Just as an experiment, just yeah, see just what a, yeah. happens. It's only, it's only 30 know? days. It's only 30 days. You know, and lots of people have written to me and talked to me and said that they've tried exactly that. They've stopped lying by their own definition, right? By, yeah. by some externally imposed definition and that the effects on their life have been unbelievably positive. Yeah. So, I mean, there's this idea, there's a deep Christian idea, and it's deeper than Christianity even, but it's a deep Christian idea that the being that is brought into being by truthful speech is good. It's like the, it's like the moral of the first few chapters of Genesis. Mm -hmm. Right. If you use the logos to bring order into being, mm -hmm. and that's truthful speech. Yeah. Then the being that emerges is good. It's like that's a hypothesis, man. It's like maybe it's true. Maybe if we told the truth mm -hmm. and, and aimed at the good, then being would transform itself around us into something increasingly less tragic and certainly less malevolent. It's harder. It's harder to be good. I think there's a line from C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. uh, where he's recalling his conversion from atheism to Christianity. And he said, when I was an atheist, I knew God didn't exist. And I was very angry at him for not existing. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, uh, he talks about um, this idea of trying to be good is, it, unless you have a standard against which to measure your progress, you just sort of feel good by, by, by default. And mm -hmm. it's kind of a narcissistic, self-plumping goodness. But when you have to avoid evil, then you realize, I am so weak. Uh, there's so few things I can do that are good. Mm -hmm. So this 30 day don't lie experiment, mm -hmm. I'm sure people in the first morning of day one are like, I got so far, so just white lies, mm -hmm. gossip and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's harder. So you're, mm -hmm. and this is where I want to go because you, you, the book is not a redo of any of your lectures from what I've said so far. It's not seen so far. It's not um, a print version. I, I couldn't detect any uh, transcript editing there. No, no, no. But it starts not. off, as some of your, your lectures do, awfully bleak. Oh, yeah. You've got bleak. the fact of fallenness and yeah. that evil's possible. And then you've yeah, got that evil's the, certain. The, it, it, that it is certain. Mm -hmm. then Tragedy and evil right. are certainties. Yeah, yeah and, that's and, the book. Man, yeah, and sure. who comes to the rescue? But malevolence on mm -hmm. top of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hard to find hope unless mm. you present something to get them from the well, it, bleakness yeah, well, that, to the light. Well, and hence, soldiers relate to you and yeah. abused people and people who've been really wounded by yeah. life and loss. Yeah, well, the and thing then, about making the bleak case is like, let's say that you are fundamentally optimistic and that you fundamentally do have faith and you do believe that truth can prevail. Then you can say, look what it has to prevail over. And mm -hmm. then the, the, the reality that it has to prevail over is the fact that life is finite and bounded by mortality and tragic and sometimes unfair. And that, it's, and that all of the suffering that's attendant upon that is multiplied almost beyond endurance by malevolence. Mm -hmm. It's like everyone knows that, especially people who've been hurt. Mm -hmm. They know that. And so then you can come out and say, yeah, that is right. You're right in your deepest suspicions. You're correct. But, but, Despite that, the power of, of love, mm -hmm. so that would be the desire for things to flourish, and the power of truth is such that it can transcend those bleak realities. And, uh, and, that, and that works perfectly because no one can dispute the bleak reality. It's like, yeah, yeah, okay, you can't, you've, you've kind of pushed that to its limit, right? Tragedy and malevolence, mm -hmm. it's like, as the fundamental defining preconditions for life. Is there something that can withstand that? The answer seems to be yes. It's like there, that's an optimistic message. You know, yeah. and I think, well, if you look at the story, the Christian passion psychologically, you'd say, well, there's an idea there that voluntary acceptance of suffering produces us a transformation or a sequence of transformations. That would be the dying and resurrecting God, that's symbolically mm -hmm. speaking. And that that voluntary acceptance and transformation is sufficiently powerful to transcend tragedy and to keep malevolence at bay. 
And I think mm -hmm. that's true. Now that's purely psychological. I think there's a metaphysic behind that. And that's where you start to move into religious territory. And I've been doing that. I do that now and then in the book, but mostly mm -hmm. it's psychological. Mm -hmm. You know, because I also do believe that there's something correct about the idea that spoken truth transforms the potential of being into habitable order. I believe that that's metaphysically true and literally true at the same time. But I don't have the conceptual wherewithal yeah. to really understand how that can be true. I, although I think it is true. Mm -hmm. 